I'm sorry, my voice is a little weird because I somehow have a virus, I guess. <laughs> How did that happen? Anyway, um, so I want to acknowledge two people, um, Malihe Safari and Mata Payambari, who are both working with me, who did some of the experimental work I'm going to talk about. And there are a few other people I'll mention at the end, too. Um, so I thought I kind of coined the term ecogenomics about a decade ago. <laughs> so what, this is how we like to think about plant viruses. Metagenomics are taking environmental samples and looking at them, and so this has been done with plants in what we call lawnmower experiments. You take a little area, you mow everything down and see what's there. But most of our work has been done in a different way that I call ecogenomics because we take individual plants and look at the viruses in individual plants. So, so we don't have this question of who's the host. We know who the host is. It's much more laborious, um, so it takes a lot more time and money to do it, but we've managed to do quite a few plants this way. So once you have that, then you do the standard things, and people have done um, both, used, used both virus-like particles isolated by centrifugation or filtration or nucleic acids, which can be treated in a variety of ways um, to look for viruses. So um, in a plant, you can have many forms of, of virus and also uh, virus nucleic acids. So you can have the, whole, the capsids within the plant cells. You can have the genomes. If there are any, can be single-stranded or double-stranded. This is a little bit misleading, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, and then the DNA viruses in plants generally are found in the nucleus, um, but they generate, obviously, DNA. And then you also have these small interfering RNAs. This is part of the plant immune system, um, the adaptive immune system against viruses and probably other things, too. So many plant viruses um, generate siRNAs, probably not all, but many. All right. so. I want to just point out a big difference between single-stranded genomes and double-stranded genomes, and that is this is a plus-strand RNA virus where you have the plus-strand comes in is in the virion. It's translated and transcribed um, through this process, and in, in this process, you make double-stranded intermediates. And a very similar thing happens with minus-strand viruses, although double-stranded intermediates are not very common. I mean, they're there but they're not abundant, so. Um, and, but when you have a double-stranded RNA genome, these behave pretty differently. The virus actually never uncoats inside the cell. They stay as double-stranded RNA. They extrude single-stranded RNA out of the virus particle, and that is used for translation to make proteins, and it's also used then as a pregenome for packaging. And the next, the second strand, the minus strand, is only made inside the virus particle. So um, Eugene was talking this morning about dsRNA um, RDRPs coming out of the single-stranded RDRPs, and I just it made me think that perhaps um, these emerge to avoid siRNA. Um, it's possible because they don't expose their S, their double-stranded RNA to the cell. All right. So um, this is. Just a summary of a number of methods um, that have been used for plant viruses. Double-stranded RNA, um, we've done a lot of that. You get single-stranded and double-stranded RNA viruses. You miss the minus sense, single-stranded RNA viruses, and of course you miss the DNA viruses. DNA, obviously, you miss the RNA viruses. Um, you can use single-stranded RNA or total RNA. That's been done uh, quite a bit. There are some issues with that. You have a lot of background, very high background. And you may also miss some double-stranded RNA viruses uh, just because they tend to be low titer, especially some of the persistent viruses that I'm going to talk about more. siRNAs um, have been touted by many plant virology people as being the gold standard for finding RNA viruses, but in fact, they probably don't find most persistent viruses. So nobody's ever cared about persistent viruses except weird people like me. I like, we <laughs> I like persistent viruses, and I'm also very interested in fungal viruses, but they have, they're both extremely understudied groups. So people have ignored them. Um, and then virus-associated nucleic acids, 
This um, is pretty good also, but it misses the unencapsidated viruses. And in plants, there are Endorna viruses, for example, that do not encapsidate, probably others as well. Um, and then in silico, is just using databases. And there are lots of problems with this. Sometimes you can find a lot. Um, if, you, if the original um, database was generated with poly-A tailed RNA, then you're gonna miss most plant viruses because not very many of them have poly-A tails. Um, you'll also probably miss low titer viruses. All right, so those are just the pluses and minuses. The basic message of this slide is there is no perfect way to find plant viruses or any viruses, really. They're all, they all have their caveats. All right, so um, we've been looking at plant viruses, doing biodiversity inventories for a while with our ecogenomic studies where we isolate the total nucleic acids from individual plants, enrich for double-stranded RNA, um, which gives us the RNA viruses, and convert that to cDNA, multiplex it, sequence it, etc. cetera. Um, and most of what we have found have been new. We've been able to classify them by family, but they don't look like other known, well-known viruses, not at the genus or species level, especially not at the species level. About 60% of reads we get this way have no hits. Um, and so are they viruses? Well, they might be, but we don't really have a way to be sure without doing a lot more in-depth characterization. Um, so far we've analyzed about 9,000 plants this way. So I know that's not a lot when you think about the kind of metagenomic studies people have been doing, but we do know who every host is in these studies, so it gives us a little advantage. Um, I also want to mention that I have, not only do I have total nucleic acids from those 9,000 plants, but I have about probably three or 4,000 additional samples that haven't been analyzed at all, and I'm, I'm looking to give them away. So I'd be happy to talk to anybody who would like to do analysis. There is a really pretty interesting um, sample set because we have, we know who every host is, we know their GPS location and when they were sampled, et cetera. So um, I'm, I'm not going to finish this project in my career, so I'm gonna just retire and leave it. So I don't wanna throw it away. I'd really like somebody to, be, to take it. So if you have any interest, let me know. All right, so the two studies we focused on, one was in the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve in, um, in Oklahoma, north, northeastern Oklahoma, and the Guanacosta Conservation Area in, in northwestern Costa Rica. So very different in terms of diversity of hosts. In the Tallgrass Prairie, there are about 700 species of plants, and we sampled most of them. In the Guanacosta Conservation Area, there are about 10,000 species of plants and we sampled quite a few, but not nearly all of them. So they're, um, they're very diverse in, the, in the Costa Rica, and also it is basically a biodiversity hotspot. It, that's about almost 3% of the world's plant species are found there, and it's an area the size of, I don't know, a county in this country. So it's pretty amazing the amount of diversity. So just want to summarize everything we got, because I'm not going to go into all the details, but this is a um, pie chart just of the various virus families and what percentage of the total they represented in these studies. And I want to point out that the ones that I have outlined in black here are what would, we would call persistent plant viruses. Over 60% of what we find are persistent plant viruses, and you probably never heard of any of these because Nobody does any work on them, and they're just, uh, you know, they've been really mostly ignored. You, what you hear about are the acute viruses that cause disease. That's what everybody has been interested in and what everybody has studied. But I don't seem to be very good at doing what everybody else does. <laughs> so I've become very interested in these persistent plant viruses. Um, the most common family in this group are the Partidi viridae. And so I'm going to talk a bit more about Partidi viridae and so the whole gen persistent viruses in general, because it really was these um, studies in metagenomics that led me to really get interested in them, because they're so common. All right, so in fact, this is from 2012, and I apologize that I haven't updated it, but it hasn't changed very much. Um, the ICTV, this is their distribution of plant virus species into different families, and they don't recognize very many 
persistent plant viruses at all. So the picture, this is the picture from basic plant virology that's been done for uh, well over 100 years, and um, it's not a very accurate picture in terms of what we know. All right, so um, persistent plant viruses are, are really pretty different. Acute viruses, they initiate an infection, they replicate rapidly, they probably reach a high titer, and they often cause disease or death. Whereas, um, well, they're always resolved in some way by recovery, by death, or conversion to chronic infections. In crop plants, we don't see chronic infections much, but they s probably are quite common in wild plants. Um, persistent viruses infect the host for very long periods of time, probably many, many generations. They are um, in several families. They used to be called cryptic. Uh, but we prefer some other term because we don't want them to stay hidden forever. Um, so they've, as I mentioned, they are very understudied. They are usually asymptomatic, although you don't always know that. Because if you have a plant that has a persistent virus, all the plants have it. And you're not going to have the, uh, the one without it, so you can't really compare. Um, it's quite hard to get virus-free plants, but we've been able to do it in a couple of systems. Most of them are double-stranded RNA viruses. They're not thought to be transmitted horizontally. Um, that probably does happen rarely with a, through fungi, in fact. They don't move between plant cells, so they only move by cell division. So therefore, they're found in every cell of the plant. We think they're not subjected to silencing, and part of the reason for this is that they are found in the meristems, and most plant viruses don't survive the meristem because silencing is very active there. Um, but they are found there. There have been siRNAs found to it in Dornaviruses, but not the other persistent viruses. And these are their families, um, and all of these families also have members in endophytic fungi. So they're also very common in crop plants. Um, you had some for lunch today if you ate any of the salads. Um, there, yeah, or any other plants for that matter. Um, so these are just some of the genome organizations of and then I just put up an example of the fungal and um, plant and fungal uh, representatives of these families. So the Endornaviridae are really large for RNA viruses. They're 15 KB. They're found as double-stranded replicative intermediates, but they're most likely really single-stranded RNA viruses based on their RDRP. Um, the Todiviridae and the Partidiviridae here have are very simple viruses. They have an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and a coat protein, and that's it. Chrysoviridae have um, up to four RNAs, and they may have three or four. And then the amalgaviridae have an RDRP and a nuclear protein, not really a true capsid protein, and don't seem to make true virus particles. Okay, so um, are they important? Well, they have these really long associations with their host with this very near 100% vertical transmission. That's why you can't get rid of them. Um, they've probably been transferred between plants and fungi, and phylogenetics of some of these, and I'll show you a little of that, indicates that pretty strongly that they have been, they have common ancestors in plants and fungi. Um, they were apparently selected during domestication because they're, they're really enriched in domestic um, crop plants, so we have a lot of them. Um, so all of these things suggest that they might be, have a beneficial effect on the host, that they might be mutualists, especially parasites that have 100% vertical transmission are generally assumed to be mutualistic. So, um, well, this is a phylogenetic tree that was published a few years ago of the Partidiviridae. This is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and they divided them into um, four groups, the alpha, beta, uh, delta and gamma, and then there's another one here, the CRISPR viruses. They also published a coat protein tree that looks kind of similar, but I'm sorry to say it's not right. Um, however, I do want to point out here that the colors on the end of these, of the tree, are, are representative of the hosts. So if they're green, they're plant hosts. If they're brown, they're fungal hosts and various fungi, uh, ascomycetes and basidiomycetes. So you can see that there are clades here that have a mixture of plant and fungal hosts, and then there are some that are all one type. Well, I um, wanted to take another look at these because they're really diverse, especially the coat proteins. So I pulled 73 um, sequences of that 
where we had both the complete RDRP and coat protein out of GenBank and translated the coat protein in RDRP. And you can't, the coat proteins are clearly polyphyletic. I mean, there's no similarity amongst some of them. So it's easier to look at this as a distance matrix than as trees. Um, and so what you have here, these are the four, these are actually five groups of RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. And that's based, they are fairly similar to the ones that have been described, but there is a fifth group here that is not part of the original tree story. Um, and then if you add the coat protein, that's shown here. So this is a little bit complicated. I need to explain it. I group the coat proteins, also one, two, three, four, and five, and then the ones with O's are orphans, so they don't have any, they don't look like any other coat protein of a Partiti virus. And the OPs are orphan pairs, so that means there were two, but I, I just made a rule that they had to have at least three to get to be a group. So if they only had two, they're just pairs. Um, so what you can see here is that the, all of the ones in group five of the RDRPs are orphans. Um, and then I just basically placed these groups um, near the, I, I numbered them the same as the RDRPs, but that's just arbitrary. But what's quite interesting is when you add the hosts in. So here you can see um, the different hosts. And in this, now you can see that in almost all cases, the only exception is here with the group one coat proteins. They're mostly from plants, but there are a couple from Ascomycete. But the rest of the um, coat proteins, the structure is completely based on the host. So for instance, group two are all plants. Um, group three are all plants. Group four are all Ascomycetes. Um, so, and then group five are also all Ascomycetes. So it seems like the way that these viruses evolved is by having an RDRP that acquired a coat protein from various different sources, probably from a host gene that then um, converged to be a coat protein. So um, we also think that there ha there's been transmission based on the phylogenies, that there's been transmission between plants and fungi, and that's probably not a real common event, but it's certainly possible. So this drawing shows when you have a fungal endophyte colonizing a plant, they grow, they can grow all through the plant. And they, the fungal hyphae grow right through the plant cells. And lots of things get exchanged at this interface. So more work has been done with plant pathogens to show that, but certainly virus particles could move there back and forth. And if this was a fungal virus that was going to become a plant persistent virus, it would have to occur here in the reproductive tissue so that it would get into the germline. Um, so this is probably a rare event, but we've been trying to m see if we could make it happen in the lab, but haven't had any luck so far. It's probably something that would take a few years. Um, all right, so in the tall grass prairie study, we found we had 220 plants that had Partiti viruses, and very few of them were co-infected with acute um, aphid transmitted viruses. So most plant viruses are transmitted by insects, some are by, some by fungi, and a few by like grazing animals, lawnmowers, but by far insects are the most common vectors. Um, so we were just wondering whether Partiti viruses might protect the plants from acute virus infection because these numbers were pretty low. Um, and whether that might not be due to insect effects. So there's been quite a bit of literature in the last couple of years in virus ecology showing that um, viruses have a dramatic impact on the plant interaction with insects. So for example, this is a cucumber mosaic virus infected plant. The virus induces the plant to make volatiles that attract the aphid vector to the plant. Once the aphid arrives, the, then the plant actually switches to making anti-feeding compounds that disperse the aphid and help transmit the virus. And there are similar but different systems depending on how viruses are transmitted. This seems to be um, fairly common. So this is why we thought, well, maybe the um, Partiti viruses are doing something to aphids. And in fact, um, so we use pepper cryptic virus because it's one we had in the lab and it's actually a fairly high titer Partiti virus, so easier to work with. 
Um, it's found in all jalapeno cultivars and a few other hot peppers, all capsicum annum. We also found it in some chiltepin, and chiltepin are the progenitor of all capsicum, domesticated capsicum annum, so hot peppers and sweet peppers. Um, there's really high level of sequence conservation, so in the chiltepin pepper cryptic virus, there's only 3% divergent to the modern pepper cryptic virus, and that's, they probably diverged about 10,000 years ago when the peppers were domesticated, so these guys don't change very much. Um, so this was the experiment we did. We put a plant with virus and a plant without virus into these cages, and then aphids are released on the top. Um, and the aphids can't see the plants. They can only detect the volatiles. And so then you just see which plant they choose. Um, it's a fairly simple and standard experiment. And what we found on the bottom here are just the controls, but what we found here is that in three different experiments, the aphids always chose um, the virus negative plants. So the virus is actually deterring the aphids. It's the opposite of what um, viruses do when they want to be transmitted by an aphid. So um, they definitely have a preference for virus-free plants. So this is a, a, could be quite a benefit to a plant to be able to deter aphid insect, um, aphids. And they also affect aphid fecundity. So here you can see that in the virus-infected plants, the fecundity of aphids is about half of what it is um, in virus-free plants. And this was done, we actually did this now with three different lines. So these different numbers refer to um, individual lines of virus-free and virus-containing jalapenos. So jala the pepper cryptic virus is not, it's transmitted at about 99%. So if you plant 100 seeds, you might get one plant that's virus-free. And that's what we did, that's how we got those. So it's kind of laborious, but works. Okay, so um, so PCV1, pepper cryptic virus 1, is a mutualist of peppers. It deters the aphids, the most common vector of acute plant viruses, and reduces the quality of the plants for aphids. All right, so I want to tell you a story about another um, persistent plant virus and, and another kind of ecogenomic study that we did on a different plant, actually a collection of, of um, many samples of one plant species. And this takes place in the Four Corners area of the United States, actually in Canyon de Chez in Arizona, which was inhabited for um, several hundred years by people that are now called the ancient Pueblans. Um, they used to be called Anasazi. And this is Antelope House, one of the more well-preserved structures. And this is a desert climate, and there are lots of lots and lots of plant remains there because these people were farmers and they grew corn and beans and so corn cobs in particular were well preserved and um, are pretty easy to come by. So I got 312 corn cobs from Antelope House um, and they all have pretty good provenance. That means that the anthropologists think they know how old they are. They weren't quite right but close enough. <laughs> So they, according to the anthropology data, they range from eight, the 8th century to the 14th century, the common era. So they're all pre-Columbian anyway, pre-European. Um, so we did the normal thing. We, we did do our RT-PCR, um, our DSRNA extractions and RT-PCR was all done in a clean room with suits and HEPA filters and stuff because we didn't want to contaminate it with modern viruses. Um, and then they were multiplexed and sequenced and so um, what we found, we found partiti viruses, but not like a consistent partiti virus, um, just pieces that look like partiti viruses. But then we found all over the place a virus who was most closely related to Anthurium mosaic associated virus. So this is a chrysovirus. It was described in an ornamental plant, Anthurium, in Hawaii. Um, and so now we found that we had a nearly complete genome of this virus, which we've named Zia maize chrysovirus. And it's in about four, we have it in four individual corn cobs, the complete genome, except for the very ends. And then we have pieces of it all over these corn cobs. So, um, in fact, here are some pictures and of the corn and the carbon dating that we did. So, in fact, this was supposed to be the oldest one, but they're all fairly similar in age. Um, these are a little bit more recent than those. 
but um, overall, they're about a thousand years old. Okay, so when we look at these genomes, um, well, we did we just placed it phylogenetically here, and um, it's you can see there's the amaze chrysovirus and its closest relative, and then these are other plant infecting um, chrysoviridae. The rest of them infect fungi. So again, we see this kind of phylogeny where they're mixed up between plants and fungi. Um, and this is the genome of the most complete genome we have from the ancient corn. So we have most of the untranslated regions comparing this to other chrysoviruses. So we, we have very close to the complete genome. All right, so um, now we, we looked in modern corn as well. And we could find double-stranded RNA bands in modern corn that were consistent with a chrysovirus, but we were not able to amplify or clone it using random primers. And actually, that's, I, I point that out because it's a problem that we find with double-stranded RNA viruses from plants and from fungi. Sometimes they're totally recalcitrant to making cDNA, and we don't know exactly why that is. They may be cross-linked. Um, they may have modified nucleotides. We've tried a lot of things to prevent cross-linking during extraction. Nothing ever helps. I've also had, like, different people. I had eight different people try this, <laughs> these samples because we really wanted to get this, and nobody had any success. But what we ended up doing was making specific primers, and we made these using the ancient virus sequences. We made specific primers, and with those, we were able to get um, pieces of the, this virus out of modern corn. And in fact, now we have the whole genome from modern corn as well, except for the five prime ends because race doesn't work on these things either. But um, overall, they're about 3% divergent. So in the last thousand years or so, this virus has changed by about 3%. Um, and both in all three genes, we have the coprotein and the RDRP. And then we also did northern blot, you know, this really old fashioned method. It's kind of cool, it tells you stuff. Um, so we did. We also looked at teosinte um, because teosinte has uh, similar dsRNAs, but um, we did not find the virus in teosinte with the specific primers or by northern blot. We only see that it's in corn. Um, so, all right. So that's the oldest known plant virus I think so far, thousand years old, and still around in our corn today. So you've been eating it probably all your life. All right, um, so we also looked at some other persistent viruses in pepper. I already talked a little bit about pepper cryptic virus. And I should, how's my time? Well, I'll just, what? Ten, ten, oh, great, okay. So bell pepper and dornavirus is uh, found in all bell pepper cultivars and it's also found in some other pepper capsicum annum cultivars. So we've, we have isogenic lines of Marengo pepper with and without the virus, but we have not been able to find any biological difference in those so far. Um, so we can't say that the bell pepper and virus is doing anything, but um, unlike pepper cryptic virus. But it is interesting, this bell pepper virus, because what we did was we, got, we collected a large number of peppers um, and we were able to, we looked at the, the phylogenetic analysis of the virus using the RDRP and the helicase, and then we looked at the phylogenetics of the peppers to see whether or not they were congruent and to see if we could figure out when this endornavirus got into bell peppers based on the, the phylogeny of the host. So it sort of worked, not completely, but... Um, so these were the seed collections that we had. All of these are from the U.S., um, but that doesn't mean they were necessarily developed as cultivars. I mean, they're all from the Americas originally, um, but some of these were probably developed in other parts of the world. But these were seed collections in the U.S., and then also we found a second endornavirus, um, Capsicum frutescens endornavirus. This was distributed around South America and also from some cultivars in the U.S., um, and then this is the only other cultivar we had where we have bell pepper and dornavirus, and that is a hot pepper. It's called chocolate pepper from Guatemala. It's kind of important in this story. That's why I pointed it out. So um, we have two essential clades in the RDRP, and, oops, sorry, no. Can I go back? Yes. Um, 
So the ones with the little squares are sweet peppers, and the ones with the little triangles are hot peppers. And most of clade one is from sweet pepper or hot peppers, and most of clade two is from sweet peppers. But there are a couple that don't fit that. Um, and in particular, their marango was actually infected with two endorna, bell pepper endornaviruses, one that's in the clade one and one down here that's in clade two. Um, and then the Yolo wonder also a, a bell pepper with a, that fell into clade one. But when we looked at the Gila case, um, Yolo wonder moves down to this clade, and now we've been able to show that it's actually a recom um, a, it's a recombinant virus, the, bell, the Yolo wonder. So we looked at we did a cast aspate using a hundred markers for the peppers to try to get a phylogeny of the peppers and. Um, well, I guess I'm going to show you the, all of the endorneviruses first. So these are the, all the bell pepper endorneviruses here, and I'm afraid that my something happened in this slide. There was supposed to be all the hosts here. Um, let me just say that all the bell pepper endorneviruses are from capsicum anum, and all of these are from other capsicum species, Bacatum, chinense, frutescens, and pubescens. So these are um, different capsicum species, some of which have also been domesticated. Um, but this is the cast assay of the peppers shown in two different ways here, and I'm not gonna go into it in a lot of detail, but I just wanna say that for the capsicum anum species, we got pretty good resolution, but for the um, other peppers, we did not, and that's probably because the markers were designed to look at capsicum anum, so they didn't work very well for the other peppers. Um, but what's interesting here is that the, um, I don't know if I can see it here, the chocolate pepper, which is here, um, that the virus here is, is um, nests between the other um, bell pepper and dornaviruses and then a chiltopin. There are two um, chiltopins here. So chiltopin, again, remember, is the progenitor of all domestic capsicum anum species um, cultivars. And so we think that that's probably where the integration, the, it moved from the chiltopin into the capsicum anum. That seems to be the root both of the plant tree and the pepper tree, or the virus tree. And you can see here, this is just the congruence between the peppers here and the virus here. And, and they're mostly congruent, but not everywhere. So one of the things that we see in the, when we look at the CASP assay with the plants is that there are admixtures, so they have been crossed and hybridized, and that's why you see these incongruent things, is because those are peppers that were hybridized, and so the virus moved uh, across to another cultivar. All right, so I think um, that is gonna wrap it up here. Uh, so I just wanna, you know, I always have to say this because I only showed you one story. I have lots more of beneficial viruses, but anyway, I hope you know that they're not all pathogens. And as a group of virologists, I'm sure you can all re embrace that idea, right? I always said I love viruses so much they can't all be bad. <laughs> um, so persistent viruses are the most common viruses found in wild plants, and they are also very common in crop plants and probably selected during domestication. Um, some appear to be mutualistic. So I want to acknowledge my own mutualistic network here. Um, besides the people I talked about earlier, Nick Stoller and Sylvia Warner were involved in the um, ancient corn virus, um, the Oklahoma plant virus biodiversity team, and my lab in Costa Rica run by Felipe Chavarria were very much involved in all the virus biodiversity work and various funding agencies, et cetera. Um, so I'm also going to do a shameless plug here for my book called The Virus. If you are a virologist, you need to have a book on your coffee table that you can show your friends and family to say, see how cool viruses are? So this is a um, popular press science book. It's very easy to read and has lots and lots of pictures. And it's available at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. So get your copy. If you have one here, I'll sign it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I just also wanted to mention one other thing. So this is a picture from Costa Rica, one of our field study sites, and you can see that the plants look really lush and beautiful and healthy, um, and yet we know that they're full of microbes. They're full of viruses, fungi, bacteria, 
And if you go a little ways away to an agricultural area, plants are looking pretty sad. So you have some pineapple there on the top and oranges. Um, and you know, the, those plants, people have tried very hard to keep all the microbes out. And it's not working too well. So um, I think we're all getting that message now that plants need their microbes too, just like we need our microbes. Um, and this is true all over the world. This is in Africa and Cote d'Ivoire, um, a national park where again you have a lot of beautiful diversity. And then on the edge of that park there is a cassava field with very severe cassava mosaic virus disease. So, so we need our, our good viruses and all of our other good microbes too. So thank you very much.